Happy Thursday and a very good afternoon. Welcome to another Fun Smart webisode powered by First Metro Securities. My name is Kara from First Metro Sec, and I, including the rest of the team, hope you find this webinar beneficial for whatever purpose it may serve. We are now on the fifth episode of our Fun Smart webinar series, and this time we have teamed up with again with our Fun Smart partner, ATR Asset Management or ATRAM. Before we get things up and running, I'd like to greet everyone tuned in a very happy Independence Day. Also, the month of June marks that we have entered the second half of 2019, and that means we've only got less than six months till we welcome the year 2020. Just timely and perfect because our friends from Atram with a topic on the first half recap and an outlook on the second half will surely be of guidance to whatever investing plans that we may have. Isn't that exciting? Now, for those of you who are new and who have yet to explore their accounts, FundSmart is First Metro Securities' online mutual funds platform, which allows you to subscribe to over 40 peso and dollar-denominated mutual funds from the six leading fund houses in the country, including, of course, ATRAM. It is located on the upper right corner of your First Metro Sec trading platform. And on FundSmart, you can also filter and sort out the various funds by its performance, risk profile, risk rating, fund type, currency, and the like for your convenience. Before handing the mic over to our speaker this afternoon, we would like to take this moment to remind everyone that you can send in your questions at any time through the side panel provided if you're on your computers or you can swipe left if you're watching this webinar through your mobile phones. We will be answering them later during the Q&A. We're also encouraging everyone tuned in right now to download the available ATRAM handouts and materials about their various funds, such as the fund fact sheets through the handout section of the side panel. This will give you a better picture of our topic this afternoon. And again, ATRAM funds are available to you online through FundSmart with no sales load. We also have exciting items up for giveaway later, including a 3,000 peso worth of Atram investment credits. So we hope you guys stick around till the very end of this webinar to qualify. We're also inviting you to join the official Facebook community if you're not yet a member. Just type in www.facebook.com slash groups slash First Metro Sec, or you can also search First Metro Sec official community on Facebook. Don't forget to also like and follow the official Facebook page of ATRAM to get their latest updates at www.facebook.com slash ATR Asset Management or visit, or visit their website at www.atram.com.ph for more information. In the previous episodes of our FundSmart webinar series, we have tackled on various investing topics. Back in our first episode, which also featured Miguel Liborio from ATRAM, we learned about the basics of fixed income and why we should invest in such securities. But for this episode, we are going to delve on a different aspect, and we will get to learn from the head of equities of ATRAM himself, Mr. Julian or Jun Tarabago Jr. Firstly, what happened to the market in the market, what lies ahead, and finally, what investment opportunities, particularly in equities, are there for us to pursue? To introduce our speaker, Mr. Tarabago here has 23 years of experience in the capital markets, with stints in both the sell side or investment research and the buy side or portfolio management. Before joining ATR Asset Management, June was the fund manager of for equities at ING Investment Management Philippines. He obtained a Bachelor of Science degree in management of financial institutions from the De La Salle University. And now without further ado, our main guy for this afternoon, please welcome Atram's Head of Equities, Jun Tarabado. Um, hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so um, it's been a, a quite an interesting start to the year. Uh, we saw this, uh, the the Philippine Composite Index, or the PSEI, up as of yesterday, I think about 8% uh, year to date. This is on the back of net foreign buying of about 573 million US dollars. 
This is in line with the strength in Asian uh, equities. Uh, Asia, when I say Asia, um, most uh, stock markets in Asia were up significantly uh, as of as of today, um, with the exception of Japan and Malaysia. So this is driven by, uh, uh, for at least for the Philippines, the growth in the Philippines is based um, is driven by uh, improving sentiment in Asia. Um, the uh, removal of the overhang from the from the first leg of the MSCI China A share rebalancing, and it is also driven, uh, I think, by the improving long-term growth prospects of the Philippine economy and of uh, the Fili the companies uh, in in the Philippines. So, if you look at the next slide, uh, the outlook for Philippine equities, uh, at least in our view, remains positive as the growth story for the Philippine economy remains intact. More importantly, the growth in the economy, so maybe to look at the economy again, we've always, I mean, in past interviews, uh, in, in past uh, market outlook presentations, we talk about the Philippine growth economy already growing at a, quite a healthy uh, pace. Um, a slide, the, the next slide will show that, but before that, I'd uh, just like to point out that this healthy growth in consumption or the domestic-driven economy will continue. Um, and what's important to note is that looking looking ahead, moving forward, this healthy growth in consumption um, for the economy will be boosted by, one, accommodative monetary policy, and two, uh, a massive... Uh, uh, we are on the cusp of a massive uh, government infrastructure spending program amounting to, I think, 9 trillion pesos the last I checked. And this spending program will start um, now in the second half of 2019. So I think those are the, um, that's a very under, un, underappreciated fact that we're actually ramping up. And to see this ramp up supplemented by uh, lower interest rates or accommodative monetary policy to support an already healthy domestic-driven economy that bodes very well for for GDP, GDP growth. So I wouldn't be surprised if after the second quarter this year, GDP growth will actually surprise on the upside. And, and I think that will be a, a powerful driver for um, not just for the stock market, but, but from investors who have um, excluded the Philippines from their, their universe of investable markets. I think this will, this will uh, trigger a multiplier effect and ultimately uh, cause a lot of new eyeballs to look at the Philippines as we start getting on that uh, that uh, significant growth trajectory after already being one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Um, yeah. So, so again, to go back, uh, the Philippine economy remains in the growth story remains intact. And what's also important is is to note is that this growth in the economy is actually translating or manifesting in terms of accelerating corporate earnings growth um, for the listed companies in the stock market. And I think for the economy in general, the companies are, uh, domestic demand is, 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 is increasing quite significantly. So this positive and improving growth story is, uh, however, will be the short term, we think will be capped by the fact that uh, there are still uncertainties uh, that, that that comprise risk that could um, maybe uh, constrain the upside or comprise uh, relevant investment risk for for any portfolio exposed to Philippine equities. And this external risk is still the the uh, risk of escalating tensions between the U.S. and and China, the trade war, so to speak. Our base case, however, is that uh, over the course of the year, at some point during the year, there still will be a resolution, uh, as we think it's the interest in the in, within the interest of of both um, countries that that um, and the global economy at that that the trade war is actually uh, settled. Okay, so on the next slide, uh, the next slide shows the trajectory of GDP growth. So um, I think it's worth noting that despite the disappointing first quarter 2019 GDP growth number. The Philippines, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is still one of the fastest growing economies in the world, uh, one of the fastest in Asia. And um, even with a slowdown, I think it was 5.6% um, in, in the first uh, quarter, uh, GDP growth was 5.6%. 
still pretty decent uh, economic growth. Uh, more importantly, looking ahead, uh, uh, more specifically after the second quarter or 3Q or 4Q 2019, starting 3Q or 4Q 2019, we believe that the growth drivers for the economy are actually quite, have, have a high visibility. The growth drivers are actually quite clear. And this is a base of very healthy consumption growth boosted by massive government infrastructure spending which will accelerate from 20 from the from the second half of 2019 onward and the third leg of growth will be accommodative monetary policy uh, as we see or we anticipate at least one more uh, interest rate cut this year by the central bank and we also anticipate at least 100 basis points uh, reduction, another at least another 100 basis point reduction in the bank reserve requirement. Uh, in the next slide, uh, yeah, can we go to the what's the next? The next slide is on inflation. So we talked about um, accommodative monetary policy earlier. We we think we believe that the recent spike in inflation was actually a fluke. It's more likely that the Philippine inflation rate will further ease over the course of the year as, as uh, rice and fuel prices go down. This gives the central bank more room to lower interest rates and the triple R rate or the reserve requirement rate. Lower interest rates, this, what this means is that lower interest rates make it cheaper or easier for businesses to grow and uh, hence potentially uh, boosting the, the Philippine economy. Next slide. Economic growth. Um, so we, we have a slide on corporate earnings, and it uh, so corporate earnings grew 14% in the first quarter of 2019. So this is significant because, as as mentioned uh, earlier, while economic because economic growth is actually flowing into corporate earnings results, the reported first quarter net income uh, from listed companies grew at as I mentioned earlier, very healthy 14% in the first quarter of 2019, and this was driven by large cap names. We estimate um, the, the core income growth. So what we do here is we, we look at the reported uh, net income figure, and we take out extraordinary items or non-recurring items, and we derive a growth rate. If we take out all of those non-recurring or extraordinary gains or losses, we actually distilled the first quarter earnings and um, we determined based on our preliminary estimates that corporate earnings, core to be more specific, core corporate earnings in the first quarter actually grew by a slower 9%. So instead of 14% was the reported number, but if you take out extraordinary uh, er, uh, uh, gains and losses, the, the core earnings for the first quarter was actually 9%. So it was a much lower number compared to 14%. However, 9% is still pretty decent uh, if you compare it to the, the five-year average corporate earnings growth rate of about 6 to 7%. So um, we think this figure will actually accelerate over the course of the year as uh, economic growth accelerates as well. So... Yeah, that's the story for that slide. Um, so, so we're seeing, we anticipate an improvement in economic growth, and we're seeing quite an encouraging, healthy growth in corporate earnings. Uh, we believe the big listed companies have great visibility on the on the this impro these improving growth prospects. And what's important is on the next slide. Uh, corporate capex is on the rise or capital expenditures so we're seeing the big companies with high visibility on the improving demand prospects and improving growth prospects these companies which have high visibility are actually putting their money where their mouth is in the form of capital spending or capital expenditures so capital expenditures by the companies so this is money going into their businesses to fund future growth. They realize, they recognize the improving prospects. That's why they're spending. So capital expenditure for the corporates over the last three years has actually gone up by a massive 77%. So talk about a vote of confidence 
from the corporates with very good visibility on growth prospects. These corporates are putting their money where their mouth is and they're spending on CapEx in a big way. CapEx for these corporates, talking about the likes of Ayala Land, SM, um, uh, the Gokong, uh, Ayala Corp, um, CapEx is up 77%. So this is a huge vote of confidence. And this vote of confidence because of improving growth is not only in the CapEx. So aside from the hefty increases in CapEx or capital expenditure, the big listed companies are also noticeably buying back their shares as their growth prospects improve and the upside potential becomes more and more compelling in our view. So the table shows, the chart shows uh, in corporate buybacks uh, up significantly to about 837 billion uh, last year from about roughly 200 million only in 2015. So that's significant increase. And if you look at the, if you look at the names or the tickers, so the names of the stocks under 20, uh, above 2018, you see that these are companies that are really buying back their shares aside from increasing CapEx. Just early this year, we, we saw, I think, Ayala Land and a couple of other big uh, corporates um, buy back shares to the tune of about, I think, 450 or 500 million pesos in just in one go. So that, for me, indicates that the corporates are, are seeing the demand and the demand is real and that they realize the potential for growth is improving, was already good and is further improving. That's why they're putting money to work. They're funding they're funding growth and they're also funding buying back their own shares because they think their shares are undervalued. From a valuation standpoint, we always hear that the Philippines is expensive, Philippines is, is multiples are higher compared to Asia. Uh, there, is a, there is a certain truth to that, and I can't say that the Philippines is dirt cheap. However, from a, from a, from a valuation standpoint, it's true we're not that cheap, especially if you look at the 17 times price earnings ratio. However, it is very worth, it is very much worth noting that the Philippine PE has actually fallen to levels before the Philippines credit rating was first upgraded to investment grade. So remember how big an impact that was. Uh, that's the, I think, the middle part of the chart. You see that the Philippines PE zoomed uh, above 20 times when they announced the, the, the credit rating upgrade to investment grade. That was a big celebration. And a big celebration carried over into stock prices, Philippine stock prices. We have since fallen to levels before that at this point, despite uh, the fact that we are actually two notches above um, investment grade. So for me, yes, we're not, we're not necessarily dirt cheap compared to our Asian neighboring markets, but the Philippines is at a level we're in. Uh, where we were at before we actually were upgraded to investment grade. And we have since been upgraded two notches higher. So that tells you about that there is actually some value in Philippine equities or Philippine share prices at this point. So um, this is not really a secret. I don't think it's a secret. I mean, these improving growth prospects that the valuations are, are actually quite reasonable at this point. Foreigners seem to have uh, recognized this fact and are starting to put their cash to work. So the next slide shows net foreign buying uh, returning this year in 2019 to the tune of, I think, 570 million US dollars. Um, this is after last year we saw net a record net foreign selling. If you take out all the placements or all the significant share placements in the market, net foreign selling in 2018 was, we estimate, at about 2 billion US dollars. And that is significant because that is like one of the all time highs in terms of net foreign selling. When you look at the, the I mean, the chart actually shows that net foreign selling was only 1.1 billion US dollars, but that includes the, the, investments, uh, the, the in equity place, the big equity placements last year. You have EDC, I think Robinson's Retail also did a, 
uh, there was also that transaction. So if you strip out all of those extraordinary uh, transactions, net foreign selling actually reached two billion US dollars last year, and that, that was like I think one of the biggest outflows in the country, uh, in 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 history, of the of the stock market. So that said, you're coming off a very low base net foreign ownership, if I remember correctly, for Philippine owner uh, Philippine uh, of Philippine shares has dropped to about 26 or 27 percent. And you're coming off a high of, I think, 32% or 33%. So this is, we're actually at a level where in foreign, uh, we're actually at a, at, at a level where in foreigners come back in a big way after selling off the Philippine uh, stock market. So we're, we're at that level wherein there's been a lot of net foreign outflows. And this is a level of foreign ownership wherein foreigners uh, either stop selling or they come back in a, in a meaningful way. So. Uh, long story short, foreign ownership levels are very low, and this could provide some support for the market uh, as we start getting uh, more positive news flow uh, from a GDP growth uh, standpoint and and other factors that we were expecting um, over the course of the year. Um, I think we're on the we're on the last one of the last few slides. Where are we? Buy equities. Yeah. So, so that's the last slide, I think. Is that the last slide? So th this, th the last slide just summarizes the, the argument um, for Philippine equities. Um, the improving fundamentals and low foreign ownership levels support significant upside for the market. The risk return proposition for Philippine stocks is likewise attractive with an upside potential for the short to medium term of about 6 to 12%. That's uh, based on index targets of about 8535 to 905, 9058. I think these are index targets that coincide with uh, multiple price earnings, multiple uh, expectations, and uh, th that blend well with the uh, support and resist the resistance levels of the market. So we think that's the upside, about 6 to 12% on the market for the short to medium term. If the and and the downside, if you look at support levels, is about four to four to seven percent. More importantly, over the long term, I think by 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 uh, 2020, we're anticipating the index to to hit about 10,000. So that's a 24 percent investment return on equities over the next uh, two years or so. So the risk return is 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 actually quite. Um, favorable for Philippine equities at this point, if we, especially if you don't look at it on a, on a short-term uh, view. That said, I think we'll leave the, the floor to uh, questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, the last slide is actually on the uh, Alpha Opportunity Fund. Uh, so the Alpha Opportunity Fund is the best performing um, peso equity fund in the Philippines uh, year to date and over the last three years. So uh, the return year to date here is 11.6%, but I think a more a more updated return is, uh, I think as of yesterday, the fund was up 15 uh, or close to 15% against the mark, the PSEI, which was down, which was up by about 6%. So it's 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 up more than double um, uh, against the the PSEI, and uh, the three-year return is is likewise uh, significant at about 35%. I think the PSEI over the last three years was up by seven or eight percent. So it's it's done relatively. Um, um, the performance has been quite decent over the over the on the year to date. And over the last three years, I think if you look at the five-year return for this fund, it's also uh, one of the best uh, performing, if not the best performing already. Um, so uh, this we attribute to um, process. We we like investing in companies that have very strong growth potential, but also have a manageable uh, implied level of investment risk. We do not buy exotic stocks just for the sake of producing good returns. We have a very thorough 
um, investment uh, process, which relies heavily on investment research and risk management. So that's allowed this fund, the Alpha Opportunity Fund, to perform well, perform well um, in good markets and actually in bad markets, if you look at the last three to five years. The fund holdings there uh, need to be updated. Uh, the, the mix has changed a little bit. Our biggest holding right now is actually first gen, which is, I, 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 what I believe, the, uh, one of the or the only pure play on renewable energy in the Philippines. So uh, we also have EI Corporation, which is still the second largest holding, which obviously will benefit from the massive infrastructure boom we are uh, on the brink of, or probably are, are already starting. Um, the third biggest stock in the portfolio is Eagle Cement, which is probably, which I think is the best uh, cement company to own. And if we're looking at a massive infrastructure boom, I, I would think it goes without saying cement is an important piece um, of that strategy. Um, Shakey's is another uh, uh, key key component, strategic component of the portfolio. And this is uh, because of uh, uh, good earnings prospects. They're only starting their their um, provincial expansion. And we think a lot of growth will come from that. Uh, high return on equity. And uh, we also have uh, the likes of Macro Asia, Megoril, BMW, uh, SSI, uh, which owns uh, Shake Shack. Probably familiar with the long lines. Uh, and pure gold, and of course, uh, favorites Megawide, um, which is also which I, we think is one of the leading construction companies in the Philippines. It also op is a actually a very good play on Philippine tourism, which we think will boom. Also, they operate the Cebu Mactan International Airport, which is the gateway to the south. Um, at some point, if they don't get their act together on the airports uh, in 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 Manila, uh, you might have a case of foreigners actually going straight to Cebu to go to uh, uh, very beautiful tourist destinations in our country uh, via Cebu rather than, you know, having to deal with the, the long lines, the long immigration lines in, in the Manila airport or at some point, hopefully, Manila airports. Uh, and then, of course, we have Wilcon also in the portfolio, which we think is a has a very good business model and um, is... is uh, very strong brand in its space, which is a uh, big box retailing. So happy to open the floor to questions, if if any. Thank you. Hope this was help helpful. All right. Thank you for that very insightful dis discussion, Sir June. I'm sure everyone who tuned in today took away valuable learnings about how they can strategize their way around the current state of the market through equity funds and perhaps taking the next step towards their financial goals. Now, before we proceed with our Q&A, we would like to remind everyone who is not yet a member to join our growing Facebook community. Just proceed to www.facebook.com slash groups slash First Metro Sec or search First Metro Sec official community on Facebook. And don't forget to also like and follow the official Facebook page of Atram to get their latest updates at www facebook.com slash ACR Asset Management or visit their website for more information. Moving on to the next segment of our webisode today, the Q&A. If you have any questions for Sir June, just type them in via the side panel if you're on your computers or swipe left if you're on your mobile phones. So are you ready, sir? Yes. Ready or not? Here you <laughs> I'm come. I'm going to proceed. Ready or I start not. with some questions which were sent via email. What is your view on cryptocurrencies? How do you think the changing monetary landscape can affect the banking system? Um, I, I think there is a there there is a space for cryptocurrencies. Only, uh, very, although this is a very theoretical answer, uh, given that we're moving into uh, a digital a digital world, or we're we're moving further into digitalization, uh, technology, digital world. It makes sense to have a digital currency. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know enough uh, in terms of valuing cryptocurrency, so I'm not quite sure if the current cryptos are 
are, are actually the ones to go with or there will be a much improved there probably will be a much improved crypto uh in the next year or so um but at this point um i've i've stayed away from crypto from investing in cryptocurrency because i simply don't know how to value them at this point but it makes sense for to have a cryptocurrency which is a digital currency as we move uh further into this this dig digital age all right, thank you for that answer, Sir June. We have another question that was sent through email. You seem very bullish on the growth story of the Philippine economy. I am curious, however, what factors could, if you see them starting to happen, make you change your viewpoint on the bullishness? Sure. Um, first of all, uh, if inflation uh, starts moving up in a, in a big way, that would that would warrant serious consideration of our outlook. Uh, review and consideration and evaluation reassessment of the outlook and um, if the if from an external for, uh, in, internally also if the current account deficit uh, balloons uh, significantly that would um, I, I think warrant serious uh, reconsideration of our, our current estimates and bullishness uh, currently from an external standpoint uh, I think the if the trade war uh, escalates and spirals out of control, I mean, I mean, I mean, the trade war between U.S. and China, then that would also warrant serious reconsideration of our investment thesis for Philippine equities. All right, thank you for that answer, Sir June. Another question, last, that was sent through email. Listed companies have, in recent years, increased their gearing in light of improving prospects and low interest rates. But how far in the future do you think interest rates can stay this low without producing a macroeconomic imbalance? Good question. Yes, very good question. Thank you for that. Um, we we think that yes, Philippine companies have increased uh, uh, leverage. Um, that's because that's also because the indebtedness or the net gearing ratios of Philippine corporates were at very low. Um, levels. One could actually say uh, non-optimal levels, uh, and they've just aligned. They, they've just increased um, leverage to to perhaps optimize uh, their capital structures. Uh, also, given the fact that rates were were still quite attractive, interest rates were still quite uh, easy or light. Um, what was the follow-up question? Uh, the follow-up question is: When do we expect rates to? Yes. Uh, but how far in the future do you think interest rates can stay this low without mm. producing a macroeconomic? Sure, imbalance? sure. I, I I don't think I'm in a position to to talk about uh, to talk very far into the future. Uh, <laughs> I will talk about uh, what what I can refer to is the central bank cycle, and the BSP cycle right now I think is more prone to cutting rates rather than uh, raising interest rates. Uh, if you extend the view to perhaps here, we think that. Uh, given the fact that the government is is primed to to increase uh, spending, that could put some pressure on on interest rates or inflation to go up. But we don't think it's going to be in a big way. Um, in other words, we think that inflation will be actually relatively behaved um, this year and next year. This year, of course, you possibly can. We we think the 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 the, the recent infl inflation number was a, a, actually a fluke, and we think that lower rice prices and lower uh, food prices uh, and lower fuel prices will actually uh, be more pronounced over the course of the year and 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 uh, result to inflation going below three uh, percent at least for the remainder of the year um, and we don't think inflation will spiral out of control next year so um, the, I think the short to medium term outlook for interest rates is 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 not worrisome at this point uh, I'm not sure about the the longer term, though, I, I, I apparently I haven't looked at that uh, long term uh, view on interest rates yet. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that answer, Sir June. Now we can uh, start accommodating questions that were sent through the webinar. We have one question, macroeconomic question. How would U.S.-China trade war affect businesses here and which sectors would be in an advantage and disadvantage from this moving forward? Okay. So... Um, the U.S.-China trade war uh, is 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 causing a lot of uh, uncertainty and a lot of anxiety and a lot of concern. 
but the main implication for for the Philippines is that uh, the the impact would be less relative to everyone else, and this is because we have a largely domestic driven economy. Um, our growth doesn't come from exports. Uh, it's it's because of what's happening on the ground, uh, consumption, infrastructure, um, uh, and 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 tourism, uh, and of course you have uh, of course. Uh, the, I think uh, a resumption in um, in in, grow, in areas that have been um, quite benign uh, recently. So the, the impact on the Philippines will be will be much less. Um, some people are saying it could actually even ben the trade war could actually benefit uh, the Philippines as outsourcing is increased. But uh, I, I I I'm afraid I don't have that kind of visibility right now. I haven't really considered that. Uh, I haven't tested that thesis yet. I don't have enough information to to say that is going to happen for sure. What I do know is we will be less adversely affected than everyone else because of our domestic-driven economy. And I think if if I may relate this to the market, one reason why foreign inflows are all, are going are coming back in. I think there was a stretch during the year wherein we had 18 straight days of net foreign selling. That ended when uh, that ended because there were um, certain funds that were seeing the Philippines as a relatively safer haven investment uh, relative to everyone else because number one, it's a domestic driven economy. Number two, the, the growth visibility for the economy, as I mentioned earlier, is very, very clear. You have a healthy consum uh, consumption driven economy boosted by uh, accommodative monetary policy and boosted by a massive infrastructure spending program that will, I think, blow out GDP growth estimates of economists over the, the medium term. Yeah. Thank you, Sir June. We have quite a personal question here. Hi, Sir. I'm a newbie in mutual funds. I recently invested in Atra OF, Atra, Atra Opportunity Fund. Although my equity, risk, equity, equity, is that equity? Oh, yeah, oh. equity opportunity fund. Although my risk profile is moderately aggressive. Is that something to worry about? I only relied on news within my circle or the network. Thank you. Uh, okay, so you invested in the Atram uh, Philippine Equity Opportunity Fund. I don't think that's something to worry about because as, as I mentioned, um, I think the message for this entire presentation is that the growth, the Philippines is going to be okay because its growth prospects remain strong and clear over the short, medium, and long term. Unless there is a uh, 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 a big external shock that happens or a massive political fallout. Actually, even political fallouts have, in, historically speaking, been the best opportunities to buy the market. Uh, but but if, unless there's a big external shock, I think you're, you're okay. Um, given that the growth prospects are clear and strong and that the corporate the corporates are actually uh, very optimistic and they have very good visibility in terms of uh, the demand supply situation for the different and the growth prospects for the industry, the different industries that they're in. Thank you, Sir June. We Welcome. have another question that is quite personal. Hi, sir. I'm way past my retirement age. What fund or funds would you suggest for me? Also, which is better for me, stocks or mutual funds? Okay. Um, normally, as as uh, as people come uh, are at or or closer to retirement age, the the percentage of their equity holdings uh, goes down, um, and their the the level of fixed income um, investments go up. So I would I would I would uh, prescribe that approach as well. So uh, the closer you are at or past retirement age the bigger your fixed income portfolio should be relative to your equity holdings. Thank you for that, Sir June. We have another question here that is quite personal, but on your side. Okay. In your years as a trader, do you think the ghost month really has an effect on the prices of equities? Uh, the, the, the ghost month, which is generally August, uh, has a an effect on prices of equities only because a lot of uh, a lot of fund managers foreign fund managers are on uh, holiday 
um, that means there is less activity in the market. That means if there is someone who needs to sell uh, and, and the big players are not there to buy because they're on vacation, then stocks can actually soften or weaken. But that's it. And for for maybe for traders, it's it's quite significant. But but for us long-term investors, it's actually you know it's actually something we look at in terms of hey, is the, is the market gonna drop enough that you know we can actually buy it at very very good uh, price levels? That's how we look at Ghost Month as an opportunity to buy at a good price, at better prices if we have a, a, a and because we have a long-term positive view on 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 the market. In terms of like changing our, our long-term investment strategy because of a month wherein fund managers are on vacation, it's not something that, that, that we do and it's not something I, I would advise as a strategy. Thank you for that question. All right. Thank you for that, Sir Jun. I think we have time for around two more questions or one more question. Okay. Uh, what do you believe... It what do you believe is the best resource for traders that are just starting out? The best resource for traders that are starting out. Best resource in terms of uh, first of all, I'm 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 not a, a trader. I am really more of a fund, a long-term uh, fund manager. But if if I were, well, in my during my trading days when I was much younger, I I relied on a uh, there's this book called uh, market wizards and uh it's it's it, it's a compilation of interviews with the best traders uh be it uh equities be it uh commodities uh or 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 currencies uh and and there are a lot of valuable lessons that can be learned from that series of books market wizards you can look it up i'm sure it's you can get it on kindle or uh audible yeah Thank you for that, Sir Jun. Thank you so much for enlightening our viewers and accommodating their questions. Thank you as well to everyone who participated and sent in their questions and the things that they were curious about. Our sincerest apologies as well that we weren't able to entertain them all due to time constraints, but fret not because we will also be accommodating these questions through email. We will do our best to do so. And thank you again, Sir Jun. Welcome. And now we are heading on to everyone's most awaited part, our giveaway. This afternoon, we are giving away three exclusive Atrium shirts and the grand prize, a 3,000 peso worth fund smart investment certificate to be invested in any, At any Atrium fund. So that's definitely the perfect way to channel your learnings from today. So here are the, here are the mechanics. Take a screenshot of the next screen, go over to your Facebook wall and post it along with a caption about your favorite part of this afternoon's webinar with Atram. We are encouraging you guys to feel the independence, like since we're still on an Independence Day high, with your entries. You can get as creative as you want, you can get specific, you can share out your learnings, you can even share your strategies if you have, or what do you plan on doing or perhaps investing. We will be choosing three lucky winners for the shirts and the one with the best caption will win the investment credits. Just please don't forget to make it public and tag us at First Metro Securities. It's that easy. We will contact the, pers the winners personally via Facebook. So once you guys are ready, go ahead and take the screenshot now. And for everyone looking into winning more exclusive FunSmart and First Metro Set goodies, we are finally on the last month of our FunSmart summer promo. So invest in any FunSmart fund, including Atrium, of course, for as low as 5,000 pesos to be entitled to one raffle entry. The more raffle entries you have, the more chances of winning. And in case you didn't know, by just investing, you can also get the chance to win ATR's grand prize, which is a staycation for two. Now that's exciting. <laughs> where where is the staycation? Fairmont. Ah, oh, Fairmont. Wow. Fairmont. Can I join? <laughs> I, I guess that's it. Flash on screen. Our AT, ATRs eligible funds available for the promo. This runs from April one to January 
rather June 30, 2019. You can find more details available on our website. And that is a wrap. Thank you so much to everyone who tuned in this afternoon. We hope to catch you on Tuesday next week, June 18, for our Besties webinar series now on our 17th episode with Marco Tarog, our Business Development Officer.